Hello there, how's your Saturday been? I've been out there carchering the patio. Filthy job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> so, quite glad to be having a sit down and uh, to join you for another story. And uh, so glad that you enjoyed last week's and I hope that you'll be uh, equally entertained by today's story. I've gone again for the lovely collection uh, from Jojo Moyes. Uh, this collection is called Paris for One and the story I've chosen to read to you today is Crocodile Shoes. So I'm just getting my glasses on. Hope you're sitting comfortably and I shall begin. She is peeling her way out of her swimsuit when the yummy mummies arrive. Glossy and stick thin they surround her, talking loudly, rubbing expensive moisturiser into shiny legs, completely oblivious to her. These are women with designer gym wear, perfect hair and time for coffee. She imagines husbands called Roop or Triss, who carelessly toss envelopes containing awesome bonuses onto their Conran kitchen tables, and who sweep their wives into bear hugs before booking impromptu dinners out. These women do not have husbands who stay in their pyjama bottoms until midday and look hunted whenever their wives mention having another go at that job application. Gym membership is a luxury they really cannot afford these days, but Sam is tied into paying for it for another four months and Phil tells her she might as well make the most of it. It does her good, he says. He means it does them both good for her to get out of the house and away from him. Use it or lose it, Mum! says their daughter, who eyes Sam's increasingly indistinct hip-to-waist ratio with barely concealed horror. Sam cannot tell either of them how much she hates the gym. It's a part out of hard bodies, the carefully designed or disguised disapproval of the 20-something personal trainers, the shadowed corners where she and the other lumpy people try to hide. She is at that age, the age where all the wrong things seem to stick, fat, the groove between her eyebrows, while everything else, job security, marital happiness, dreams, seem to slip effortlessly away. You have no idea how much they put up the prices at Club Med this year, one of the women is saying. She is bent over, toweling her expensively tinted hair, her perfectly tanned bottom barely covered by expensive lace knickers. Sam has to wiggle sideways to avoid touching her. I know! I tried to book Mauritius for Christmas. Our usual villa has gone up by 40%. It's a scandal. Yes, it's a scandal, Sam thinks. How awful for you all. She thinks of the camper that Phil bought the previous year to do up. We can spend weekends by the coast, he'd said cheerfully. He never got beyond repairing the back bumper. Since he lost his job, it has sat there on the drive, a nagging reminder of what else they've lost. Sam wriggles into her knickers, trying to hide her pale, mottled flesh under the towel. Today she has four meetings with potential clients. In half an hour she will meet Ted and Joel from print, and they will try to win their company the deals that they've been working on. We need this, Ted had said, as in, if we don't get it, he pulled a face. No pressure there, then. Do you remember that awful place in Cannes that Susanna booked? They are braying with laughter. Sam pulls her towel more tightly around her and heads to the corner to dry her hair. When she returns, they are gone, an echo of costly scent lingering in the air. She breathes a sigh of relief and slumps down on the damp wooden bench. It is only when she is dressed that she reaches under the bench and realises that although the kit bag there looks exactly like hers, it's not hers. This bag does not contain her comfortable black pumps, suitable for pounding pavements and negotiating deals. It contains a pair of vertiginous red crocodile skin Christian Louboutin slingbacks. The girl at the desk doesn't blink. Uh, the woman who's in the changing room, she's taken my bag. What's her name? I, I don't know, there were three of them. One of them took my bag. Sorry. Uh, I usually work at the Hills Road branch, or probably best off speaking to someone who works here full time. But I've got meetings to go to now. I can hardly go in my trainers. The girl looks her slowly up and down, and her expression suggests that wearing trainers may be the least of Sam's sartorial worries. Sam glances at her phone. She's due at the first meeting in 30 minutes. She sighs, picks up the kit bag, and stomps off towards the train. 
She cannot go into this meeting in June shoes. This becomes obvious as soon as she reaches the publishers, whose marble and gilt offices make Trump Towers look positively Amish. It is also apparent in Ted and Joel's sideways glances at her feet. Getting down with the youth, are we? Joel says. Going to wear your leotard too, says Ted. Perhaps she's going to conduct negotiations via the medium of free-form dance. And he waves his arms, a la Isadora Duncan, moving them about to the sides. Funny. She hesitates, then curses, rummages around in the bag and pulls out the shoes. They are only half a size out. Without saying anything, she whips off her trainers in the foyer and puts on the red Louboutins instead. When she stands, she has to grab Joel's arm to stay upright. Wow, they're um, not very you. She straightens, glares at Joel. Why, what's me? Plain, you like plain stuff, sensible stuff. Ted smirks. You know what they say about shoes like that, Sam. What? Well, they're not for standing up in. They nudge each other, chuckling. Great, she thinks, so now I get to go to a meeting looking like a cool girl. When she emerges from the lift, it is all she can do to walk across the room. She feels stupid, as if everyone is looking at her, as if it's obvious that she is a middle-aged woman in somebody else's shoes. She stammers her way through the meeting and stumbles as she leaves. The two men say nothing, but they all know that they will not get this contract. Nevertheless, she has no choice. She will have to wear the ridiculous shoes all day. Never mind, still three to go, says Ted kindly. She is outlining their print strategy in the second meeting when she observes that the managing director is not listening to her. He is staring at her foot. Embarrassed, she almost loses the thread of what she's saying. But then, as she continues, she realises it is he who is distracted. So, how do the figures sound? she says. Uh, good, he exclaims, as if hauled from a daydream. Yes, good. She senses a brief opportunity and pulls a contract from her case. So, shall we agree on terms? He is staring at her shoes again. She tilts one foot and lets the strap slide from her heel. Sure, he says. He takes the pen without looking at her. Don't say anything she says to Ted as they leave, jubilant. I'm saying nothing. You get us another deal like that and you can wear carpet slippers for all I care. At the next meeting, she makes sure her feet are on display the whole time. Although John Edgemont doesn't stare, she sees that the mere fact of these shoes make him reassess his version of who she is. Weirdly, it makes her reassess her version of herself. She charms. She stands firm on terms. She wins another contract. They take a taxi to meeting four. I don't care, she says. I can't walk in these things and I've earned it. The result is that instead of making their usual harried, sweaty arrival, she pulls up outside the final meeting unruffled. She steps out and realises that she is standing taller. She is a little disappointed, therefore, to discover that M. Price is a woman. And it doesn't take long to discover that Miriam Price plays hardball. The negotiations take an hour. If they go ahead, their margins will be down to almost nothing. It feels impossible. I just need to visit the ladies' room, Sam says. Once inside, she leans forward over the basin and splashes her face with water. Then she checks her eye makeup and stares at herself in the mirror, wondering what to do. The door opens and Miriam Price steps in behind her. They nod politely while washing their hands, and then Miriam Price looks down. Oh my God, I love your shoes, she exclaims. Uh, actually, they're... Sam begins, and then she stops and smiles. They're great, aren't they? Miriam points down at them. Can I see? She holds the shoe that Sam removes, examines it from all angles. Is this a Louboutin? Yes. I once queued for four hours just to buy a pair of his shoes. How crazy is that? Oh, it's not crazy at all, says Sam. Miriam Price hands it back almost reluctantly. 
You know, you can always tell a proper shoe. My daughter doesn't believe me, but you can tell so much about someone from what they wear. I tell my daughter exactly the same thing. The words are out of her mouth before she even knows what she's saying. I tell you what, I hate negotiating like this. Do you have a window for lunch next week? Let's the two of us get together and thrash something out. I'm sure we can find a way through. That'd be great, Sam says. She manages to walk out of the ladies without the slightest wobble. She arrives home after seven. She's in her trainers again, and her daughter, who is just heading out, raises her eyebrows at Sam as if she's some kind of bad lady. This is not New York, Mum. You just look weird, like you've lost your shoes. I did lose my shoes. She puts her head around the living room door. Hey. Hey. Phil raises a hand. He is where she knew he'd be, on the sofa. Have you done anything about supper? Oh, no. Sorry. It's not that he is selfish. It's as if he cannot rouse himself to do anything anymore, even the cooking of beans on toast. The successes of the day evaporate. She makes supper, trying not to feel weighed down by it all, and then, as an afterthought, pours two glasses of wine. You'll never guess what happened to me today, she says, handing one to him. And she tells him the story of the swapped shoes. Show me. She heads out into the hallway and puts them on. She straightens a little as she heads back into the living room, injects a little swagger into her walk. Wow. His eyebrows shoot up to somewhere near his hairline. I know. I wouldn't have bought them in a million years, and they're a nightmare to walk in. But I pulled in three deals today. Three deals we weren't expected to get. And I think it was all because of the shoes. Not all of it, surely. But your legs look fantastic. He pushes his way up so he's sitting straight. She smiles. Thank you. You never wear shoes like this. I know, but I don't have a Louboutin shoe sort of life. You should. You look... You look amazing. He looks so lovely then, so pleased for her, and yet so vulnerable. She walks over to her husband, sits on his lap, links her arms around his neck. Perhaps the wine has made her giddy. She cannot remember the last time she approached him like this. They gaze at each other. You know what they say about shoes like this, she murmurs. He blinks. Well, they're not made for standing up in. She is at the gym shortly after nine on Saturday morning. She's not here to thrash up and down the pool or to strap herself to one of those merciless machines. She has a different ache one that makes her blush faintly with remembered pleasure. She has come to return the shoes. She pauses in front of the glass doors, remembering Phil's face as he woke her up with a mug of coffee. I thought I'd start on that camper today, he said cheerfully. Might as well make myself useful. It is then that she sees the woman at the reception desk. It is one of the yummy mummies, her hair in a glossy ponytail, railing at one of the staff. On the desk is a familiar gym bag. She hesitates, feeling a reflexive clench of inadequacy. Sam looks down at the bag by her feet. She will not come to this gym again. She suddenly knows this as surely as she knows anything. She will not be swimming, or sweating, or hiding in corners. She takes a breath, strides in, and puts the bag down in front of the woman. You know, you really should check that you pick up the right bag, she says as she grabs her own. It's a bit rich taking someone else's shoes. Honestly, I wonder what kind of people this establishment lets in these days. Sam turns on her heel. She is still laughing when she reaches the train station. She has a bonus payment that is burning a hole in her pocket and a pair of very unsuitable shoes to purchase. The end. Hope you like that one one of my favourites so far and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your weekend and that you can join me again next Saturday when I'll be reading for you. Stay safe, stay home, stay well.